Hello, my name is Grant Richards and we're going to be talking about audio today. And actually before we get into the stuff, talking about the equipment that we'll be using, I want to talk about some of the terms um, that are often used on set. Uh, one of the most common ones that uh, new uh, people on the set uh, don't know is the, the term um, MOS. Um, it stands for mid-out sound. It's actually a German phrase and it means recording without audio. So when the cinematographer is busy at work um, and it's an MOS shot, uh, recording audio is not necessary. That's actually one of the next things I wanted to talk about is on uh, professional sets, they don't use the audio from the cameras. In fact, some most film cameras don't even have um, audio in them, like modern uh, camcorders do. Um, they have a separate recording um, mixer and recorder, um, and so you have to sync the sound. And we're going to talk about the slate and uh, mixer. Um, there's Grady on the mixer. Um, and we'll talk about that later, but um, MOS is the first term, and then um, the next thing I want to talk about, too, is something that um, it's really important for uh, audio mixers to uh, remind the AD, the assistant director, and that is ambient sound. So you, the, it's important that the mixer remind the AD that they get ambient sound. Uh, and when they do that, everyone on the set has to be completely silent. No one can move, and oftentimes it's a 30 to 60 second uh, recording where um, all they do is record ambient sound. And that's all the background noises. So we're in my home right now. I hear a cricket outside. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, I think my refrigerator's on. And so those are kind of distinctive sounds that are unique to this house. Well, um, at some point, if the refrigerator turns off and um, we need to cut together two scenes, they, you, you can hear the difference. And so you really want to record ambient sounds. And sometimes you need to do two or three different um, sounds. So maybe the room, room tone, with the refrigerator and room to tone without it. So room tone is something that um, the audio mixer has to remind uh, the AD to record um, every time you change locations. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I talked about how camcorders um, record audio sometimes. The RED camera, which we'll be using a lot, does record. It's not very good sound though. The microphone, first of all, is a long ways away and we're going to talk about how um, oftentimes we want the microphone as close as possible. Right now I'm wearing a lavalier. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's right here next to my throat. So that sound is good or sometimes we use a boom to extend a shotgun mic. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but the, the scratch track, the audio that the camera records is just, a, it's kind of more of as a reference. When you're trying to find files or match, you know, sync things, sometimes that can be beneficial. But the scratch track, the unusual sound um, is something that's important to get, but often, almost never, is it something that you'll ever use in, in the final cut of the film. But it's important to know the term scratch track. Um, the other term that I want to talk about is diegetic sound. And diegetic sound is when sound emanates from within the shot. So if you think about, for example, uh, I don't know why, but Tarantino uh, came to mind. And he's had several um, car scenes in his movies, and they will, in Pulp Fiction, turn on the radio, and then suddenly there's music playing. Well, that sound is emanating from the, the car radio, and that's diegetic sound. In uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window, um, they used, the only music was, di with the exception of opening and closing credits, um, the only music was diegetic. There was a composer who played the piano up in the loft, and he would play, and that's the music that we heard throughout. We also had um, uh, ships um, passing by, uh, things like that. But the sound that emanates within the frame um, is diegetic sound. So those are a few terms that you need to know before we kind of get started. Let's start um, by talking about microphones. And, you know, first um, I want to talk about, you know, oftentimes there are microphones like these um, that uh, you often see singers will hold them, you know, they'll use them for music. Um, they're cardio um, microphones because um, they're somewhat directional. 
Uh, it sounds louder um, here. If I, I can still pick up some sound here, but if I get um, behind the microphone, you can't hear it anymore. So it's a uh, cardioid is kind of a directional microphone. Um, these are kind of workhorses. They're um, quite often uh, used uh, for music or things like that. Not quite as common um, on a movie set. On movie sets, if we're going to use a microphone, we use um, super hyper uh, cardioid uh, microphones. We call them these um, uh, shotgun mics, and they are very, very directional. Um, they, uh, in fact, I have two different ones here, um, and the, the only real difference is that one, it's longer. The longer the shotgun mic is, the more directional it is. So if, for example, this was facing me here, um, that would sound very good, but as it's starting to be off a little bit, um, the sound quality goes way down. Um, on this one, it's even more extreme. So that would sound good and that would sound terrible. Um, they're, you know, very, very, um, well, the longer they are, the more directional they are. Um, and so that's really important when we are booming um, them because they are, you know, so directional. You'll notice that the shotgun mics have uh, these uh, little openings or uh, tubes um, along uh, the shotgun mic and the sound really um, comes from the very tip, so it's very directional. They, the sound that comes through these tubes um, enter the microphone at a slower speed, and so it becomes out of phase, and the microphone kind of then cancels it out. So the longer the shotgun mic, the more uh, holes in the tube and the more the sound gets out of phase. So it's a bit confusing. Just know that the longer the microphone, the more directional it is. Um, it doesn't mean that it um, can necessarily pick up sound from longer distances. It just means that it's more directional and it cancels out all the other sound around it. So um, we often use um, shotgun mics on a set. Now this thing that's attached to it is called a shock mount. Um, I've used several different kinds over the years and I, I actually like this best. It's they're rubber and they slide in and then they hold the microphone pretty tight. Uh, and then this just then mounts on top of a boom pole. This is a um, one type of boom pole. You can loosen it up and extend them. Um, I think this one goes to 12 feet, so you can you know, extend each of the sections and then extend that over a long distance. But um, I'm gonna just simply mount this uh, shotgun mic onto this boom pole. And when I do this, it becomes pretty rigid and I can then can control uh, pretty accurately the uh, microphone. So um, the boom pole allows me to extend it and then I can control it kind of by spinning it. I'm also able to uh, adjust this, loosen it, and I can adjust the microphone this way. So if I'm, someone was holding this over the top of me and they wanted to come down, they could have it this way. But if, if I wanted to extend it, um, I could tip it up and then hold it um, from a longer distance. So there's some flexibility. I really do like um, these shock mounts. I was mentioning that I've used some others. Um, this shock mount, which is now worthless, and one of the reasons why I don't like them, it's interesting because it has a nice clamp. It can hold the, the um, uh, shotgun mic pretty well. Um, but it's actually suspended by um, elastic bands, kind of like rubber bands. Um, but they very quickly kind of stretch and become, well, first, the first thing that I noticed when I uh, started using it is it became more and more wobbly. If you moved it, the microphone would move and all those sounds would um, pick up. You, they call it handling noise and that's a real problem. Um, and then eventually they started to stretch so much that it just kind of fell apart and um, I don't even know why I've not thrown it away in the garbage because um, I would never use that again. But um, there are different kinds. Um, I like the more rigid kind with uh, rubber. 
Um, and you do, there is some handling noise on this too, but it's, it's firmer and there's, I find that there's a much less handling noise. The other thing I wanted to show you, if I um, take you, uh, show you this, um, the end of this, the way you plug um, a microphone in, and it's really the other kinds that I showed you as well, is we use um, XLR cables. And um, I have a huge variety. I have, uh, I know that I have a few, sorry about that. I have a few 200 foot um, um, XLR cables, and I have 150 and 75 and 25. I even have, I think, um, I have a shorter one. I think this is only 10 feet. Um, uh, I know that I have a six inch, um, but anyways, they come in a lot of different lengths and it's important not to have more cable than you actually need. If you need to run a microphone 100 yards, then yes, you're gonna need 300 footers uh, to get there. But um, if you're gonna have a mic on a mic stand right next to your mixer, you know, a, a two foot XLR cable would be better. But anyways, um, they have male and female ends and let me uh, show you the two ends of an XLR cable. So um, the uh, female ends are the ones with the three holes in them and then the male ones are the ones that have the three um, pins that stick out and you can figure out why they call them male and female. But um, if the, the microphones have the male and the XLRs plug into them and it's simply you match up the holes and they click in. Um, and then to remove them, you, you push the button and just and to pull it out. But So if we put that in, we can then run our XLR to our recorder. And we'll show you the recorder later. But um, XLR cables are very, very common on set. You'll see them um, all the time. Nowadays, they are have, doing more wireless recording. For example, this um, lavalier that I'm wearing is wireless. Um, but, but quite often, microphones are hardwired with XLR cables. Um, the one thing that you got to know um, about XLR cables in particular is how to um, wrap them. If I was to drop this and start wrapping, if you ever were to do that type of thing on a set, you'd probably get fired or kicked off right away. You want to um, do the over-under technique. And so you, without stressing it, you kind of wrap your cables um, by twisting them so that they very naturally go into a, um, a nice even loop like that. So um, we use the over-under technique and we'll practice that on set, um, but XLR cables. Okay, we've switched seats because we're going to demonstrate a few things for you. So again, shotgun mic on a boom um, being held by the shock mount and the XLR cable is running over to Grady who's sitting at the mixer and recording what we're doing. Now we're still hearing the uh, lavalier that, that I'm wearing and I'm going to shut up in a minute so we can hear the sound. But uh, one of the things I wanted to show you is I'm going to do kind of a directional uh, mic so I can show you at first. So that's why I have it in this angle. Uh, here and then I'll show you how that might change. But one of the things that I want to do is I, if you you can hear this, I'm, in fact I'm going to be quiet now. But you should be able to hear handling noise. So when the cable moves, there's a lot of noise. So um, what I like to do is I, I like to spin the boom so that there is no loose XLR, um, so you don't hear that noise. Um, so that's important. Also, if I am, if I move my hands or make too much radical movement or shake the boom, that makes noise too. And we'll listen to that now. So I'm sure you can hear that as, as well. And I can't hear it at all, but I know because I've mixed sound a lot that when the boom and cables are moving a lot, um, that has handling noise. We, we use that term. Okay, so I want to um, uh, show you how the quality of sound, and we're going to have the camera close so you can see. And by the way, uh, one of the things that we do with the shot, shotgun mic is we want to get it as close to the subject as we can. Actors get very used to having the microphone right in front of their face. 
if we're doing close-ups. If we're uh, doing a wide shot, sometimes I have to keep the microphone a long ways away. Sometimes uh, if uh, certain angles, I have to mic from below. Um, and we will we'll adjust that. But um, actors are very um, comfortable with that. So I'm going to shut up now. Um, can you first introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Maria. And I, I'm hoping that sounds very good. Now we're just going to have her say her ABCs, and you'll um, hear how the noise qu quality changes depending on how I hold the microphone. So right now it's perfect, and then you'll see as it moves how the sound quality goes down. So I'm shutting up. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, O P Q R S T U V. Okay, so I'm back to talking again. Now, um, what you I'm hoping could hear on that is that when the microphone is right at her, the sound was very good, and as it went away, the sound got bad. Now, if when we're mixing this, we're using my lavalier, you won't be able to hear it. But um, if we were using the boom, that should sound great. That should sound terrible. That is absolute, I mean, that's what's happening upstairs in my house. So uh, we want to be as, as uh, close to the mouth and the throat as you can. So it's funny because I watch bad boom operators and they're not paying attention. You know, they're looking at their watch or whatever and they're holding the microphone like that. Well, none of that's usable. That's terrible sound. So if you're uh, operating the boom, and by the way, um, that's pointed in the right direction. I see some boom operators who they're too lazy to make the adjustment. And if their microphone is like that because they were doing something like that, now suddenly they have the boom and it's, I mean, they can probably hear their footsteps better than, than the person they're booming. So you want to make those adjustments at all times so that uh, the microphone is as close as possible. And that's why we always, um, do frame checks where we'll bring it in, bring it in, out, 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 out. Okay, see it. So we know that the boom can be that close, and uh, we try to get it as close as possible. The closer the sound is, even though it's a, a very directional microphone, the closer it is, the better the sound. So um, if you get to boom this semester, make sure that you hold steady, no handling noise. If, for example, I was going um, between two people, I might very slowly move, um, or even better, rock the microphone back and forth between two people um, with uh, as little movement as possible so we don't have handling noise. So um, our first boom lesson. Okay, so uh, we've done the boom. The boom is very common on set because actors move around um, rooms or if you're gonna film outside. Um, by the way, if you are gonna film outside, um, oftentimes wind is a problem. And when wind blows into a microphone, it creates a lot of sound. And I didn't talk about the windsock. And um, this is a windsock. And it, it simply, it has a hard layer on the outside and I don't want to open mine up, but there's a layer that blocks wind and then there's this fuzzy looking thing on the outside. And it just slips onto the microphone like that. Um, and then um, whenever we're outside or, and there's any kind of uh, air movement, but even a fan inside could uh, do the same thing. It makes it a lot heavier, so we don't use it inside if we don't have to. Uh, but a windsock will um, knock the wind down. You don't get that whoosh, you know, awful nasty sound. So a windsock is very common. But when you're inside um, and the actors aren't moving, or if you do things like a uh, looping session, oftentimes we'll use a stand. Um, and it's 
um, different than like a mic stand, I thought I had one in here, um, that a singer would use where it's simply a pole coming up and um, you the singers will hold on to it. Um, this is often um, for something like a shotgun mic and uh, that way someone doesn't have to handle the boom. We get the microphone really close. Oftentimes if you're doing a looping session, you speak right into the mic. Um, one of the things that um, we'll talk about when we do looping sessions, looping, ADR, dubbing, all um, similar terms, uh, when actors are re-recording their uh, lines uh, from a scene, um, you want the microphone to be as close to the actor as it was when it was originally recorded. So if I have a microphone right next to my uh, mouth, that might sound really great, but if it's a wide shot, it sounds really weird when you're recording the microphone right close. So you'll want to move it away a little bit, adjust it, and now suddenly that will sound, it's actually aimed at my eye, so um, you, you want to do that. Now that sound is going to be quite a bit better. So uh, mic stands are, uh, if you don't have enough people and you can't don't have someone to hold it, or if you're going to do a looping session or something, um, we often will use a mic stands. So um, mic stands. Okay, um, earlier we talked about how um, separate audio is recorded uh, different than the camera and the way we keep them in sync. Well, in the old days when they recorded on film, they had to match up a, uh, the action of the slate so they, would, they could see the slate close and it would make a loud noise. So you'd see the peak in the waveform and you'd see the slate close and they would um, match those two up and that's how they would um, mix them. Um, this is actually called a slate. It's a digital slate, so um, I can actually turn it on, and there's time code uh, that will run, and it's actually not synced, so it's uh, not going to have, um, it's not going to be jammed to the cameras. This is a, the slate. I want to talk about how uh, we uh, use this. Uh, first of all, let me show you that um, the power is, if you look at the front, it's on the left, and uh, the left button, there's, uh, you could turn it on and off. Um, the button on the right, um, you actually has brightness. So if you were to look at this, uh, you can see that um, all the way to the right is the dimmest and then uh, to the left it's the brightest. So um, if you're outside, um, you want the brighter in the sun, you want to have it brighter. If you're inside, you can save battery and make it dimmer. So uh, that's on the right. Um, we actually keep a color um, roll on the back so we can match colors uh, if you want to do color correction, but this is all part of the slate. Now, the slate is basically a slave. The, the, the slate doesn't create time co code, it holds it. So what we need to do, if you see on the side here, we use a quarter inch uh, adapter and put it into the slate. And then uh, we have a, uh, two different cables. One, uh, you can see uh, when we undo this, this will plug into the recorder. Ours is the F8. Um, and we can plug this in. And it is the F8, our recorder, that cr generates the time code. And then the slave holds it. Then this is a, a timepiece. And we can then plug this in and plug this into the red camera, for example, and sync. And then when we uh, sync audio from the F8 and then plug it into the camera, they are exactly have the same time code. So digitally, you can, um, in Premiere or Final Cut Pro or uh, other software, you can select your audio, select your uh, video files, and uh, with a command, you can say sync to time code, and now you don't have to try to match that up. So it makes it very simple. Um, we're going to uh, have a session on the F8, and we're going to show you how to jam. But this is what we're jamming to the slate. So uh, very important in matching audio and video on a, a camera set, I'm not a film set.
Okay, uh, we've swapped seats again and Grady is still mixing and, and sitting in the hot seat. And I wanna talk um, both about the mixer. Uh, we have the Zoom F8. There are a lot of different brands, by the way. Um, I've owned like three or four Tascams. I owned a Korg. Um, there's a, a huge list. Um, they're all um, great. I, I really like the Zoom, and I like the Zoom F8 in particular. Eight stands for eight inputs, and if you look on the side, you can see that there are uh, uh, XLR inputs. One, two, three, four, and then if we swap the sides, um, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight inputs. I'm, this is weird because I'm <laughs> taking... Uh, Grady's um, mixer away from him in the middle of his job. But um, the, there are eight inputs, and eight, eight inputs is fantastic. And quite honestly, like today, we're using one because uh, we're using my lavalier. Um, but at, at one point, we did the boom and the lavalier. There's two. Um, I remember doing a scene where there were six actors, and we had each of them laved up. So there's six microphones. And um, then there were two groups, and so we had two booms. So I had eight m inputs all at once, and so the Zoom can handle that quite well at a very um, high quality sound. It's very lightweight, you can see how small it is. Another thing that I really like about the Zoom is that it um, is battery powered. Right now it's plugged in, and if you're um, it, that near a power source, that's convenient and nice, but if you have to shoot remotely, um, it has a a power pack it has eight AA batteries and you can run off battery power so if you were out in the field or something um, you don't need power and that's very convenient oftentimes i will uh, use uh, you know a strap that um, goes around my over my shoulder and, and keep it right here and i can mix and record from my hip so um, that's you know very uh, convenient i really love it Okay, I want to talk about how, you know, we mentioned the slate and um, uh, we talked about how the uh, F8 uh, creates the time code and it syncs, we call it jamming, um, the audio with the slate. So we actually take this port, we plug it in, and let me show this camera right here. So um, it says in and out. It is out of the zoom because the zoom is creating the time code. So I um, put it in and turn, it locks in place. Now we want to go through the uh, features here. And then um, I simply open up the slate and uh, the, once we've jammed, they're um, jammed together. So that is um, the slate. Uh, and uh, the recording devices like the Zoom are the most accurate. They are way more accurate than anything else. In fact, um, the uh, film or video cameras will often have drift. They'll slightly uh, drift out of um, uh, exact time code. So um, after the day, end of a day shooting and sometimes even at lunch you, and you power down, you need to re-jam. Uh, the most, the, the, uh, the F8 is what creates the, the time code. Let's go through some of the features on the F8. So we talked about the XLR inputs, but we also have two headphone jacks. So Grady's listening to one, um, and here, for example, this is a quarter inch. So I hope this doesn't hurt your ears, but you can see it's a quarter inch and now he can hear me again. We also have the mini jack that we can have. So we have two sets of headphones. Um, and this is weird, I'm hearing myself. Now, um, I say that you have to have at least two sets. One for the mixer, who's constantly listening for any problems with sound, and then one goes uh, for the director. Oftentimes they'll have um, uh, splitters so that other people at the director's table, like the AD, um, can listen as well. I also like um, the boom operator to hear so that he or she knows if um, he or she is making any handling noise. So oftentimes we'll have a splitter off the auxiliary and one will go to the director's table and one will go to the boom operator. And a lot of times you have to have a longer extension cord so the boom operator can hear. But that is where our um, uh, 
headphone jacks are. Now let's look at the, I'll take that out. No one's listening to those. I'm going to move this around. And um, I don't know well how you can see this. I'm going to hold it up so you can see it well. We have our meters here. Now we have it on a setting um, that has only four channels. You can change this so that it has all eight channels plus um, the stereo mix. I'm going to turn it back because I like to see them. It's a little larger. Um, but this is the meter, so we can tell that in channel one we are recording. Now, uh, because Grady's so good, we can see uh, that he has it at a really good level. I like it at um, uh, zero to uh, six dB. Uh, if you start to get too high, I'm talking really loud, you can see there was a little bit of red in there. That's not good. But the nice thing about the F8 is it has both a compressor and a limiter. So a compressor um, will help take out those, you know, unwanted bad sounds and a limiter will also turn it down so there's not distortion um, but still um, it can pick up some of that sometimes so um, you want to you know, ha have it mixed well um, here are the headphone so i don't know uh, if he has it on the auxiliary or the headphone is that changing the volume so if i turned it really <laughs> If I wanted to be mean to Grady, I could turn that all the way up and hurt his ears. But that's how you control the, the volume on the headphone. Um, each one of these knobs controls the eight inputs. So um, they're all set to zero. Um, you actually, uh, this button here for each of them turns them on. There's, you really don't want them on if you're not going to be recording a channel. So Grady has just channel one turned on. And then here are... Um, the buttons. The one on the far right, the green one, is the power. So if you push that button and hold it, it will turn it off. This is the record button. Um, that's the stop button. So at the end of each take, you want to hit the stop. But if you push play, you can then hear back the, the, the clips that you just heard if you wanted to test it or, or play it for the director, for example. So it's pretty um, straightforward. Um, the main thing is keeping the levels uh, at the right place so that it's not too quiet or so loud that it is the limiter is um, turning down the, the volume. So I think those are the major features about the F8. Um, and it's a lot like most mixers. Um, but if you're going to be doing audio on any of our shoots, you, you really got to know it um, before you um, can mix one of our, our scenes or one of the, the films that we shoot. Here is how we're going to get to the jam so that the zoom can uh, control uh, the F8. So first I hit menu then you can see I can scroll down beyond there is time code I hit enter and uh, enter one more time and there you can see it at the bottom and I just want to scroll down until it says jam once I do that I hit enter and that is creating the time code and you can actually see the time code reading out and you should be able to match it with the slate okay when we've got that we simply go to menu menu, menu, and now we're back where we can see the audio levels and we're ready to record. Okay, that's it. Uh, we've covered um, some of the equipment like the microphones and the boom and, and how to uh, manipulate that. We uh, talked about the F8 and the mixer and how important that uh, is. Um, we even talked about the slate and, and jamming um, time code from the F8 to the red. Um, so I think all of you should be ready after our uh, quick uh, lesson. Uh, now what we got to do is start uh, making movies and if you're on audio uh, you will know how to use the F8 or how to boom uh, properly and we'll get good clean sound for our movies. So thank you for joining me and um, see you next time. Mm -hmm.